This is again the first chapter from First Timothy, verse five. As we wait there, uh, we got it. There we go. There we go. Now all of us have it. Let us say Amen. 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 All right. So we'll see there the scripture. Paul, he wrote to Timothy and he said to Timothy, now the purpose of the commandment is what? Love. From where? Pure heart. From where? Pure heart. From where else? From good conscience. And then from where else? Sincere faith. Okay, from where? Sincere faith. Sincere faith. Again, said the purpose of the commandment is love, from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Amen. Now, from that verse, I want to focus on, and I want to talk about today for a thought, manifesting good from a sincere heart. Again, my thought for today is manifesting good from a sincere heart. So a question for you all today. Are you manifesting good in the world? And if you are manifesting good in the world, are you manifesting good from a sincere heart? Hard. That is the question that I ask all of you today. I believe that that is a question that all of us as God's children, I think that that is a question that all of us, we must take into serious consideration. Are we bearing good? Are we manifesting good? And are we doing it from a sincere that is an honest, that is a pure heart. Now, somebody somewhere, they may begin to wonder, well, what is good? What is the good that I am supposed to do? And the reason why somebody may wonder that is because, well, good, as we know, good can be and is subjective for many people. We're from uh, the first chapter of first Timothy, my key verse was the fifth verse. However, the good that I am speaking of today, I want to make very clear to all of you what that good is. The good that I am speaking of today has been defined to us by the Lord. Therefore, the good that I am speaking of, it is the good that is holy it is the good that is righteous, not by man's will, not by man's definition, but by the Lord, by God's defining. God has defined for all of us through his only begotten son, through his instructions, through his word, what the good is that we are to manifest in the world. Yet, even though many of us know what this good is, there are many today who profess that they are doing good. They profess that they are manifesting good in the world. They profess that they are laboring for the Lord, that they are doing the good work. But the labor that they do, the actions their actions, as we know, it speaks louder than words, but their actions, they say that they are doing everything but laboring out of the good that God has defined as good. I don't know if you hear me here today. The manner in which they labor can best be described as insincere and disingenuous a manner that betrays the very basic principles of the Lord, his way, and his instructions. 
Now here, when we take a look at Paul's first letter to Timothy, we will see that Paul, he wrote this first letter to Timothy with laboring for the Lord, clearly being on his mind. We'll see there in the opening of the letter to Timothy that Paul, he said to Timothy to wage the good warfare. And then at the end of this letter, over in the sixth chapter of this letter and the 12th verse, you see where Paul said to Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Again, we see the word good appear there. And again, we should have a sense and an idea in our mind of the good that the Lord was telling Paul to, to wage in the war and to fight for. Again, that good, again, has been defined by the Lord. Everything that the Lord said is holy and righteous. That is good. Now here in my key verse for today, there in the fifth verse, we'll see where Paul, he said the purpose, the goal of the command, the command that he had given to Timothy that you'll see in the third and the fourth verse where Paul, he had charged Timothy to essentially minister the sound doctrine and to let others know to minister no other doctrine, but the sound doctrine. Paul, he said that in the fifth verse that the purpose of the command was for Timothy to move in a certain manner. The manner is summed up by one word, which is the basic principle that our faith is founded upon. Our faith, it is founded upon love. We are to love. We'll see there that in the fifth verse, that love is mentioned there. And in the King James version of the fifth verse, the word love, you will not see it. You will see charity in its place, which I believe is a better word to use to define the desire that, that Paul had for Timothy to, to use here. You see, when, when we think about charity, we think about the act of giving, don't we? We, we think about the act of giving out of goodwill. We, we think of moving with no ill intent, don't we? So charity is used there in the fifth verse. And again, as you have heard me say before in the past, our faith, it must not be stagnant. Faith, it is not simply a word that you say. You can't just say that you believe. Faith, it requires motion. Faith, it requires action. And the same can be said for love. It is not enough for you to say that you love. It is not enough for you to say that you have love. Again, actions, they speak louder than words. Our faith, it must be put into motion. And our love must be put into motion as well. When both our faith and our love when they move, it separates us from those who do not move in faith and in love. It separates us from those who are insincere in their faith. It separates us from those who are disingenuous in their love. So with this understanding in mind that we are to move with charity, we should understand that Paul, he desired for Timothy and he desired for us believers today to move, not simply to profess our love, not to simply profess our faith. We are to have charity. We are to move. And again, we are to move in three certain points. Those points we'll see there in my key verse. 
They are the points of, again, having a pure heart, having a good conscience, and having sincere faith. I want you to understand today, the believer should move with a pure heart. And when I say a pure heart, even though I do like this, I'm not talking about the heart that beats. My heart is over here. You'll notice that I did like this. We are to, to be pure in our hearts. The only one that can make us pure in our hearts is Christ. We are to have a good conscience. We are to move with a good conscience. And we are to have sincere faith. There should be nothing full. In other words, there should be nothing fake about our heart, about our love, about our actions, if you will. If you truly desire to manifest good in the world today, your good, it must come from a sincere place. I don't know if you hear me here today. Your actions, they must be pure. Your love, it must be pure. Your faith, it must be real. It must be sincere. You see, if we move in any other way, we find ourselves approaching a very dangerous territory. You see, there are many who will say today that they have good works. And I asked the question, are you manifesting good in the world? And, and there are many today, Andrew, that will say they have good works. And they'll be proud to say, yeah, pastor, I got good works. And they will tell me every single good thing they have done. They will tell me all of their good deeds. But many of those who like to boast and like to brag about their good deeds, they, they move in a manner that, again, I say to you today, is insincere. They move in a manner that is disingenuous. If we say that we are a child of God, if we profess our say, ourselves as, as the children of the Lord, we are believers. If we profess and say that we are Christians, but the manner in which we labor in is insincere, I want you to understand today that you are going to draw the ire of someone you are going to draw the ire of someone who you should not desire to upset. You see, there's a certain group that drew the ire of this someone. And they would have come, they would come to realize that they did not need to draw the ire of this someone. We'll see this certain group spoken of in the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel. I want you to turn over to the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel today and join me as we will see that Jesus, he had a warning in this 23rd chapter. He had a warning for the multitudes that had, had gathered themselves together to him. They wanted to hear a word and Jesus, he had a word for them. Now we'll see that in the 23rd chapter that the warning that he had for this certain group, it starts there in the second and in the third verse there. I still hear some pages turning. I'll let you get there. We'll see that in the second and in the third verse. I don't hear any more pages turning. We'll see that Jesus, he said to the multitudes there, he said, the scribes and the Pharisees, that go that certain group again. He said, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. And he said to the multitude, he said to them, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But then he said this, he said to the multitudes, 
but do not do according to their works. Do not do according to their works for they say and do not do. The scribes and the Pharisees here, they had drawn the ire of the Lord. They, they had drawn the ire of, of Jesus here because they labored in a manner to where they proclaimed that they were laboring for the Lord. But again, Jesus, he said there in the third verse, he said to the people, don't do as the religious leaders were doing. Why would he say this to those people? Why would he say to the people there, essentially, do as the scriptures say to do. Do as the scriptures taught. Do as the law commanded, but don't do as the religious leaders. Don't do as they do in their actions. You would think that Jesus would say to the people, hey, those religious leaders, you should follow them. You would think that that's what he would say to the people. I would hope, it, again, even though I ain't perfect, I want to be very clear about this. I say this all the time, even though I ain't perfect. I would hope that Jesus would say to someone, hey, even though Pastor McCrary ain't perfect, but still follow his example because he strives in a manner that, that pleases me. I will hope that Jesus of my works will say, hey, pay attention to, to Leo. Because Leo, even though he ain't perfect, he sets the example for at least manifesting some kind of good in the world. That's what I hope that Jesus would say about me. And I hope that you will hope that Jesus would say the same thing about you today, rather than what he has to say here for the religious leaders. You see, these religious leaders, they had that outward profession of faith. The same outward profession of faith that many people have today that like to go around and tell somebody that they are a child of God, that like to say that they are a Christian. The religious leaders, they had that outward profession of faith. But again, as the saying goes, actions speak louder than words, don't they? You know how it is. People come up to us all the time and they say something to us. But, you know, we, we are type the people, we're the type of people that like to sit back and we like to wait. We, we, we going to wait to see what you actually do. You know, it ain't enough for you to come up and say something to us and say what you can do for us. We're going to actually wait and see what you do. That's why a lot of people find themselves in trouble today because we're the kind of people that's going to, going to sit back and we're going to wait. As James said in, in his letter, faith without works, that, that faith is dead. And so we'll see here that Jesus, he adds on to that point that James made here. Well, the religious leaders, they could brag about their works. Now, we've seen that before. Y'all remember uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, they went to the temple to pray. And that Pharisee, he bragged to God in his prayer about his works and, and how he gave. Y'all remember the Pharisee in my sermon last week with the certain woman that came in and was sitting at the table, you know, or she wasn't really sitting at the table. She was behind Jesus and her eyes were, were filled with tears and, and she wiped off his feet. And how the Pharisees sat relaxed, you know, reclined back across the table from Jesus. You know, he could sit in that manner because he would have had his works. They were proud of their works. So it's not just enough for your works to say something about your faith, because there are many today that, again, have that outward profession. Jesus, he said here today that our works must not be dressed up. We should not move in a manner just to have works for works for the sake of, again, having works. Our works, they must not be dressed up. Our works, they must not be done just to be to making us look good. And we must not do works just for the sake of doing works. I don't know if you hear me today. 
See, there are many people that, that have their charitable deeds that, that do good just to be able to say that they done did good. Now, we'll see that in the fourth verse of the religious leaders' works. That Jesus, he said, they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They will move those burdens with one of their fingers. You see, again, the religious leaders, they had their works and, and part of their works, they believe was to go around and to instruct and to dictate the law unto others. They would get up, Sister Horton, you, 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 you with me right now, I feel. They would get up and, and they would preach, but they would not do. Jesus already told us they didn't do. There are many people today that'll get up and they'll tell somebody, hey, that ain't right what you're doing. They'll point out everybody's sins. But then when they get behind closed doors, they ain't going to want you to look and see what they be doing. You, you don't want that to be you. you know, like I said, all of us, we have those skeletons in our closet. You better watch the way that you move. Those religious leaders, they would get around, they would instruct, but they wouldn't help those that they instructed. You see, there is more to the works that we do. It's, again, not enough to profess. It is not enough to be verbal. What do your actions say about you? What do your works say? say about your faith. When Jesus looked at the works of the religious leaders, he didn't have nothing good to say about their works. We'll see that in the fifth verse that Jesus said, all their works they do, they do it to be seen by men. He continued on there in that fifth verse. He said, they make their phylacteries broad and and they enlarge the, the borders of their garments. The, the religious leaders, let's be clear about this. Those religious leaders, they, they weren't doing works out of sincerity. It wasn't coming from a pure heart. Those religious leaders, they were putting on a show. They would go out, they would do good. Yeah, they would do good. But it wasn't because they actually desired to do good. There's a difference. I want you to understand. There's a difference when you desire to actually do good, and then when you do good just for the sake of, oh, I better do this. You get it? The religious leaders, they didn't even do good for, oh, man, I just better do good. They didn't even do it for that. You see, these religious leaders... They love to put on a show because they wanted to build up a name for themselves. We, we are supposed to be doing good to glorify the Lord. That's why we're supposed to be manifesting good in the world. As we, we know, we are to bear fruit, holy and righteous fruit that, that glorifies the Lord. But the religious leaders, they love their title. They love themselves. They love to make a name for themselves. They love themselves more than they love the people. Not only did they love themselves more than they love the people, they love themselves more than they love the Lord. They love themselves more than they love God. Can you imagine yourself loving yourself more than you love God? You're going to go out and you're going to do good, not because you want to glorify God, but because of. Look at what Jesus said there in the seventh verse, if you don't believe me. Jesus, he said there in the seventh verse, he points out there that the religious leaders' efforts of putting on the show of doing good, it drew the praise of the people. He said that they love being able to go to the marketplace and for, for people to shout out, hey, John. Hey, Adam. 
as they went through the marketplace. The religious leaders, they did good because of the greetings Jesus said in the marketplace. The, 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 the religious leaders, they would go to the marketplace and, and the men, Jesus said, they would shout out, hey, rabbi, hey, rabbi. Like I said, they did good to be seen. They did, they did good to, to, in other words, as many people do today, to be famous. Uh-oh. His word against religious, against the, the works of the religious leaders here, and they, they speak a lot to how people operate today. You know, there are many people who do good, and many of us, sometimes we have to sit back and we have to question the reason behind their doing good. There are many people today who do good. They have their charity, and we have to wonder if politics was at play. What, was there some kind of ulterior motive at play? There are a lot of times who people, when people come up to us, they actually sincerely desire to do good, and we have to kind of hesitate. We kind of have to step back slowly because we can't believe that they're actually desiring to sincerely do good. This says a lot about our world today to where the one who is sincere in their hearts and desire to do good is questioned because of those who have an ulterior motive like the religious leaders in the good that they did. You see, the reason why Jesus warned the people about following the actions of the religious leaders was because their actions, it said a lot about their heart. And, and, and Jesus, he speaks to their hearts there as we take a look at the 27th verse there. Well, rather than having a sincere heart, Jesus said that on the inside, the religious leaders, they were full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. He said that in the 28th verse that on the inside, these people who they really were, they were full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's who the religious leaders truly were. They were hypocrites. They were lawless. And if Jesus is saying that they were lawless, Jesus is saying that they were sinners. They were corrupt. They were wicked. You see, if their hearts were in the right place, the religious leaders, they would have been opening up the doors to the kingdom of heaven. They would have been opening up the gates to the kingdom of heaven for the people. But we'll see that in the 13th verse that Jesus, he said, the religious leaders, they shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. This they did by their actions. They said one thing, but they did another thing. They were not pure of heart. They didn't have a good conscience and they certainly were not moving out of sincere faith. You see those points, they, those points are the three manifestation points for us to be able to manifest good in the world for all of us as believers. Let me be clear about that for all of us to be able to bear fruit that is holy and righteous. Again, let us remember we must have a pure heart. We must not only have, but we must move with a pure heart. We must have a good conscience and we must have and move out of sincere faith. The religious leaders, they lacked in all three of those parts. They didn't have a pure heart. They didn't have a good conscience. If they had a good conscience, they wouldn't have been carrying on doing the things that they were doing. They would have felt that they were wrong in their actions. When you have a good conscience and you do somebody wrong, it weighs on you, don't it? But, but these religious leaders, they didn't have that. They didn't have sincere faith. If you don't believe me, look there at the 14th verse. 
where Jesus, he tells us just how crooked these religious leaders were in their hearts. And Jesus, he said that they devoured widows' as houses. Now, some of us, we, we may not understand what that means. But what that meant was that the religious leaders, they actually moved like predators. Those who were in need, the religious leaders, they preyed upon. They, they took from the widows who they should have been helping out and they defrauded the widows saying, Hey, we can help you out. If you just give a little bit, you know, some people, they, they, their biggest gripe about church is that the church be begging for, for money all the time. We don't do that here, right? We, we never beg. We just put in whatever it is that we have. And if we don't have, we don't put anything in. That's fine. But the religious leaders, they would take and they would take and they would take out of greed and they would build themselves up while not uplifting anybody else. How could that have been good works? And I consider today what happens in the world today. And in considering today, I consider the words that Paul share with Timothy over in the third chapter of second Timothy, where again, we have seen this scripture. I referenced this scripture before where Paul, he spoke about the perilous times that we live in where Paul said that people would be lovers of themselves. Paul said people would be lovers of money. They would be proud. Paul said that people would be blasphemers. That is, they would speak against they will move against the Lord. Paul said that people will be unthankful. They will be unholy and unloving. Do we truly think for one second that God would be pleased with anyone who moves in such an insincere and disingenuous manner today? Those who are unholy, those who are unthankful, those who are lovers of money, those who are proud, those who are blasphemers, those who are lovers of themselves, those who are lovers of pleasure rather than the Lord. Do we really think for one second that God would be pleased by them in their way and their actions? Nope. I don't think so. Y'all said, uh, uh, so it seems y'all don't think so as well. And Jesus there in the 14th verse there in the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, we'll see that he warned, he warned that those who labor in a manner as the religious leaders did, especially when we know better, Jesus, he warned that, that we or they that move in that manner will face greater condemnation for such insincere labor. Are you following along with me today? Again, I asked you the question today, are you manifesting good in the world? And if you are, are you manifesting good in the world from a sincere heart? My hope today is that you are, that you are manifesting good in the world and that you are manifesting that good from a sincere place, from a sincere heart. Again, having a pure heart, a good conscience, and that you are moving in sincere faith. Now, if we have questions about the good that we are to do and how we are to go about doing the good that we should be doing, we will find that Jesus, he again, he spoke to the sincerity that we are to be moving in. We will find this over in the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel from the first down through the fourth verse.
And in those verses there, we'll see where Jesus, he taught the disciples and therefore he taught all of us the very important lesson when it comes to charitable deeds, that is again, works that are of love. To the disciples, Jesus, he said there in the first verse, he said, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. The religious leaders, they could have used that one, couldn't they? What Jesus is saying there. He's saying that, that your works of love, they don't have to be done to be seen by anybody. The desire of Jesus is for us to simply do good out of the sincerity of our hearts. As I said weeks ago, when I was talking about finding our identity, we know that our identity today is as a child of God. We know that we are a child of the Lord. And I said that as a child of the Lord, we are to be a blessing to somebody. Jesus didn't tell us to to become famous. Jesus simply said, do good. Look at what he said there in the second verse. There in the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel, he said there in the second verse, He said, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you ask the hypocrites in the synagogues and in the streets. Guess who the hypocrites were? The religious leaders. We already seen that. Again, he said there, he said, don't sound a trumpet. You don't have to make a bunch of noise when you're doing good. It, it, it really bothers me when people have to sound a trumpet about the good that they're doing, especially around this time of year. You know, this is the one time of the year where people seem to remember that they're actually supposed to be good people, where, where they're actually supposed to help folks. And, and the ones who haven't been good and helping people all year long, they, they take this one time of the year to say, hey, I'm helping somebody. <laughs> they, they pull out their phones and they hold it up and they say, hey, you, you see, I'm helping this person right here. I'm doing this good. They want the whole world to know that they are helping somebody out. They want the whole world to know that they're doing good. Does that sound like they're doing good out of sincerity? Does that sound like their charitable deeds are are sincere? You see, those that like to draw attention to themselves, they, they are doing good for the very wrong reasons. Jesus, he said in that same verse there, he said that they are doing good so that they may have the glory from men. He said, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. They, they, they will have their reward. Jesus said they, they will be praised by those that they seek praise from. But there in the third and the fourth verse, Jesus, he said, when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. Again, the desire from Jesus His goal is for us to simply do good out of sincerity. We don't have to boast about the good. We don't have to call somebody and let them know that we are doing good. We don't have to post pictures on Facebook, on Instagram, or wherever else to let the world know that we are doing good. Jesus has said, simply be good because that's who you are supposed to be. As a child of God, we are supposed to be loved because our father is love. Our father simply does good because he loves us. Guess what we are commanded to do? Love the Lord with our whole heart and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Yep, I did it again. 
Imagine desiring to be praised by men rather than being praised by the Lord. I don't know about you all today, but I much rather labor. I much rather manifest good in the world to be praised by the Lord than to be praised by man. I, I much rather the Lord see my good than somebody like me that see my good. The child of God should desire to do good because again, we are meant to be a blessing. So I, I want this to be very clear to you all today. When I get into my next point here today, don't ever do good with the desire to make a name for yourself. Don't ever do good with the desire to be praised and to be glorified by those that are around you. Now, if somebody happens to see it and they happen to say to you, Hey, good job on that. That's good on them. That's good on you as well. But don't you go out seeking that by the good that you do. Do good because, again, that's who you are. We'll see over in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians, where Scripture encourages us time and time again to do good, to have good works. Over in the sixth verse of the ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul, he said, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, in our consideration, many of us, we, we labor to, to reap bountifully in our consideration of that verse, don't we? And many of us, we will labor and we will labor and we will labor to reap bountifully. But again, I warn all of you today when it comes to your labor, when it comes to your charitable deeds, don't let your labor become filled with insincere works. Yes, the notion that Paul is, is speaking of there is to be bountiful, to be plentiful in our works, in our charitable deeds, but don't let your charitable deeds become insincere. Don't let your charitable deeds become mechanical. Mm -hmm. You see, many of us, we, we let this part of, of Paul's notions here, we let this part become very burdensome on us. As we will labor, we will give of ourselves so much that we won't have anything left to give. And even when we don't have anything left to give, we'll still be trying to give. And then our giving, it can become bitter. We can begin to regret in our giving. Should we become bitter in our giving? Should we become regretful in our giving? Well, the answer to this question, Paul gives to us there in the seventh verse of the ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Well, Paul, he said, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a what? He loves a what? A cheerful. Not a giver that gives out of spite. Not a giver that gives out of regret. Not a giver that just gives to give for the sake of giving, that gives mechanically out of religion. Uh-oh. God said he desires for you to be happy in your giving, cheerful in your giving. The Lord wants you to be joyful in your giving. You see, when we manifest good in the world today, it should be a joyful occasion on not just our part, but on those who receive of our giving. Mm -hmm. You see, again, there are many people today who fake it till they make it. 
what I mean by this is that they are faking their faith. They are faking their giving. They aren't giving out of a pure heart. They aren't giving with a good conscience. They aren't giving out of sincere faith. They, in other words, they're not giving out of sincere loving. They're giving just to give. And the one who they give to are able to sense that. And they take no joy in receiving. The only one who is happy at that point in time is the one that holds up their phone and say, hey, I gave to somebody today. And the only ones who will rejoice and be happy with them are the ones that will be sitting there clicking like, 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 like. (laughs) Paul, he tells us there that if we are unable to give, if we are going to be regretful in our giving, if we don't have of ourselves to give, Paul is essentially saying there, keep it. If you are unable or regretful to, to give in charity, that is in works of love, keep it. Do not hurt yourself. When you give in that manner, you hurt yourself and the one who receives. We are to be uplifters of souls. I say that all the time. And when I say that, I want you to understand that I mean it today. We are to be a blessing. And those again, who we give of ourselves to, who we give our charity to today, they are able to sense when it is sincere and when it is insincere today. Again, we must give of ourselves. Now, when we get around to this time of year, many of us, we, we begin to wonder, well, what can we give? What is my charity? We, we often wonder that today because around this time of year, when again, those people who finally remember that they're supposed to do good, they like to air commercials encouraging you to do good. They, they, and I don't want anybody to think I'm making light of this. I'm making jokes of this. They'll sit the boxes out in the stores and they'll say, Hey, drop a toy off in the box. They'll ask for canned goods and they'll ask for turkeys. And again, I want to be clear about this. There is nothing wrong with giving when you have that to give. But many of us, we begin to feel pressed when we are unable to give because we have that good conscience, right? And so many of us, when we don't have monetarily, we may feel bad that we don't have money to be able to give, right? When we don't have materially, we begin to again feel a bit depressed because we don't have the materials. We don't afford, we don't have what we can afford to be able to give materially. And so some of us, we sit back and we begin to wonder in our good conscience, well, how can I help? What is it that I have to give? And some of us will say, I don't have anything to give at all. But God wants you to know you do have something to give. You see, when we as God's children, when we begin to believe that the only thing that we can give is money and materials, I want you to understand that we limit our giving We limit ourselves. We limit the Lord as well. For what we may lack monetarily, what we may lack materially, what we may lack physically, I want you to understand today, we have a great amount of wealth built up. We may be in poverty, but Christ look at us and say that we are rich, just as he did for the church that was in Smyrna. We are rich today in spiritual wealth, in spiritual riches that the Lord has blessed us with. You see, all of us, we have gained a great deal of wealth because all of us who are of sincere faith, we live in fellowship with the Lord. And through our fellowship with the Lord, we have gained knowledge of who he is. We know that God is able, and that's some riches right there. When you know that God is able, when you know that God is able to lift up, that God is able to bring life to the spirit, to the soul that is dead, 
When you know that God is able to quicken you, when he is able to renew your strength, you are rich today. You have an intimate relationship. You know of the Lord and he has blessed you greatly. You are blessed and you're highly favored in his eyes. And what should you then do with those riches that the Lord has blessed you with? Should you be selfish and greedy and keep it to yourself? Or should you be a blessing and give what it is that you have gained? We have spiritual witches today. A door has been set before us. And we should put everything it is that we have gained from the Lord. We should put it out into the world. We should manifest that good. We should bear the fruit that we have in us. As I have preached all year long, this very point to see the word of God has been implanted in us and it has made us rich and we should bear that fruit. We should bear that holy and righteous fruit. Jesus, he said in the sixth chapter of Luke's gospel and the 38th verse, he said, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. You see, I am reminded of the parable of the talents here. Where in the parable of the talents, Jesus, he said that there were two servants who received from their Lord and they went out and they worked with what they had received from their Lord. And one day their Lord returned to see that they had doubled what they received from him and, and their Lord, regardless of what little or much that they had received from him, because they labored sincerely, the Lord said to them, good job. Well done. Thy good and faithful servant. We know that verse so well, don't we? And, and, and Jesus said that the Lord, that he gave to them a reward. They entered into the joy of their Lord. They were greatly blessed. But then there was one servant who received from the same Lord that buried what he had received. Didn't labor at all. And did the Lord tell him, good job, well done, thy good and faithful servant? Nope, he didn't. The Lord called that servant crooked, called him wicked, called him unprofitable. And then that servant was cast into the outer darkness that we talked about in our Sunday school lesson today. I, I don't know about all of you today, but I much rather hear from the Lord I much rather hear from my savior today. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I desire to hear Jesus say of me and the fruit that I have bared, that I have labored in this world. The deeds that I have done, no, they may not be as great as somebody else, but I pray that, that my deeds are rewarded by Jesus. What about you? Are you manifesting good in the world today? And are you doing it from a pure heart with a good conscience and from sincere faith? If you labor in this manner, I promise you today, Jesus, he will say to all of us, well done, good and faithful servant. That is what he will say to us. So on this Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving sermon, let us take this with us. Let us labor in a manner that will manifest good in the world, not just this time of the year, but as I always say, every Thanksgiving, let us do it all of the time. Every second, every day of the year is an opportunity for us to manifest good in the world. And we should take those opportunities every time we get. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this sermon and that you'll be able to apply what you have watched, that you have heard, that you have listened to. Apply it to yourself and then share it with somebody somewhere. And if you haven't done so already, 
make sure that you're following the Newfound Faith channel. Be sure that you're following today so that you don't miss a sermon, so that you don't miss a Sunday school lesson, a Bible study, or a food for thought. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you share the Newfound Faith channel with someone somewhere.